Hey guys, I want to talk about something today that's been on my mind for a little over a week, um, maybe longer, and, and honestly, I've just been too lazy to do anything about it. So I finally took a little bit of time um, a few days ago to, to put together a little quiz that I would love it if everybody would take, because I think it is the type of thing that will give you an enormous appreciation of interpreting data. So if you've never done an experiment in your life, if you never planned to do an experiment in your life, if you've never built a model, looked at a model, don't know what a model is, none of that matters. If you've ever consumed information, you need to understand the concept that I want to explain right now. And I put together a little quiz to help you do it. But before I get to that, let me back up and explain the concept. Okay. In the preceding months, we've talked a lot about models that were used to predict the impact of the coronavirus on our population. Uh, things from how many people will be hospitalized, how many people will uh, die, how many people will ultimately be infected, all of these things. You may recall I've done at least one video where I've talked about the limitations of these models. And in particular, I did something called a sensitivity analysis. The sensitivity analysis is where you vary some of the inputs to the model and look at how small perturbations here impact the outputs. And um, what you may recall is that the R0, which is the reproductive number, was arguably one of the most sensitive inputs to the model. In fact, it was insanely sensitive. Um, you know, everything that goes into the model is an assumption. I'm going to come back to that limitation shortly. But for example, if you were trying to um, input the fatality rate, that is a linear input. So if you say the fatality rate is 1% and assume, well, actually, let me change it to 0.5% or 2%. That's a 50% change in each direction. It has a 50% change on the output. There's some more nuance to that depending on hospital utilization and stuff, but directionally, that's true. However, if you change R0 a little bit, 2.0 to 2.2, meaning each infected person can infect two people versus 2.2 people on average, that would have a profound effect, a mushrooming, exploding exponential effect on the output. It was part of that work on our own models that pretty quickly led me, and of course many others, many people far smarter than me have come to the same conclusion, including the folks at 538, who I respect greatly, that said basically modeling is now a fool's errand. There's almost no role for modeling. Um, and a big part of it has to do with the fact that we don't have anything to put in the models. So it's not the building of the models that's the fool's errand. It's the uh, blind faith that we would put in models, especially when we don't get to put data into the models. We put guesses. Okay, so let me explain uh, what that means. Let's assume I'm interested in building a model to understand how many uh, chestnuts are going to appear um, on my front lawn over the course of this year. So how many chestnuts make their way onto my front lawn? Um, so I think about it. I put together a model that makes sense. It includes a million variables. And one of those variables is going to be how big the squirrels are um, that come into my property, right? Because more squirrels and bigger squirrels can eat more chestnuts and presume, I don't even know if that's true, by the way, but I don't even know if squirrels eat chestnuts, but let's pretend they do. Um, so that would become a very important input to the model. Now I could guess hmm, average squirrel weighs, I don't know, 700 grams. Okay. Maybe that's a big squirrel, but whatever. But wouldn't it be better if I didn't have to guess if I had actual data? And if I had actual data, what would it look like? Well, it wouldn't be a number it would be either a number with a confidence interval or a range, or it would be a probability distribution. And when you have that, it says you're communicating and accepting the uncertainty of the inputs. And that can be reflected in your outputs. So now your output isn't just a number, X chestnuts. It's either a probability distribution that says, look, I don't know exactly how many chestnuts you're gonna have at the end of the year, but it's gonna look like this. You know, there's a, uh, there's a long tail to it. You're probably going to have this many somewhere in here, but it could be as many out here. If it's normally distributed, it would be a nice symmetric shape bell curve, etc. So I want to click into this idea of what a confidence interval is, because you see it reported when you look at data. Um, and sadly, you don't see it reported when people are not using data, as in the case of these models. So when people say I'm 95% confident in this estimate, what does that mean? Do you have an intuitive sense for that, for what, for what that is? Most people don't. 
Um, it, I think it's intuitive that the more confident you are, so as you go from being 50% confident in something to 70% confident to 90% confident to 95% confident, you would have to include a larger and larger range. But I want to use a little trick that I learned um, back when I was at McKinsey uh, and I was doing corporate risk. This was a trick that we used um, when we were bringing new people in to help them understand what that felt like. Now, I couldn't find the old test we used to do, so I had to make up a new one. So the way this test works is I'm going to ask you 20 totally random stupid questions for which I would not expect anybody to know the answer. But the exercise is to write down a confidence interval that is that you are 95% confident contains the answer. Does that make sense? I'm going to ask a question. Your answer is a range. This to this, and you are 95% confident the answer resides in that range. Okay, so these are 20 dumb questions I pulled out of my you-know-what. The distance from the Earth to the nearest star, excluding the sun, in light years. By the way, these questions are all found in a beautiful PDF on my site. So it's at petertiamd.com forward slash confidence. It's also under the little click, the little heading deep dive. And there you will find the tests, the answers, and the interpretation. Okay, question two, what's the GDP of Mongolia in US dollars? Three, what is the height of the tallest man in recorded history in inches? What is the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean in meters? What is the average distance from the Earth to the moon in miles? See how I'm going back and forth between inches, miles, and meters to give you the metric and non-metric version? Population of Russia in 2019. The maximum number of passengers carried on an Emirates A380 aircraft in the two-class layout, not to be confused with the three-class layout. The number of passengers who died on the Titanic the market capitalization of Apple on the day Steve Jobs died in US dollars, the fastest lap in an F1 car around the Monaco circuit in minutes and seconds, the number of regular season goals scored by Wayne Gretzky in his NHL career, the NASA budget for the calendar year, pardon me, fiscal year 2019 in US dollars, the number of Big Macs sold globally in a year on average by McDonald's, the number of students from China attending U.S. colleges in the 1819 academic year. The total number of passengers flying domestically on U.S. airlines in 2019. The amount of coal produced by U.S. mines in 2019 in pounds. The breeds eligible to compete at the 144th Westminster Kennel Dog Show. I can't take credit for that question. Actually, one of my research analysts came up with that. I'm not smart enough or creative enough to come up with that question. The total number of worldwide searches processed by Google every day. The full weight, including planes, ammunition, people, of a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier in pounds. And lastly, the number of times the name Jesus appears in the King James Bible. Also, I can't take credit for that question. That was Rachel. Okay, so again, what's the exercise? You are going to go and download that PDF, which again, the link will be somewhere around this video. Um, if you just go to my site, forward slash confidence, or under deep dive, you'll see 95% confidence interval. There's two things to download, but start by only downloading the quiz, print it out, take the quiz, take as long as you need, but obviously don't look anything up, and you're coming up with a 95% confidence interval. So a range for each of those questions that includes your best guess of the answer. And you, again, I'm asking you to be 95% confident, not 100% confident, not 50% confident, 95% confident. You're then gonna download the answer slash interpretation. You will grade yourself, and more importantly, you will interpret the results. And my hope is that that interpretation gives you a sense of meaning when you look at data. When you look at someone, say, the hazard ratio of eating bacon and getting diarrhea is 1.34 and my 95% confidence interval is this. And more importantly, it should give you an enormous amount of humility around interpreting models that can't even provide confidence intervals because they are not based on data. They are based on guesses. And in those guesses, the fact that we don't even attempt to provide a 95% confidence interval, which I'm asking you to do, is what I find most troubling about the nonlinearity 
and frankly, lack of utility of these models. So I hope you all take a moment to do this quiz.